we're going to have the panel number two here. We've got a whole bunch of uh, very distinguished guests that I managed to rope into to coming out to this thing. Thank you very much for taking time out. Um, so our first panel was looking at really the, the first link in the chain about how developers look at it, what kind of obstacles are in place from an economics, regulatory, and, and so on. Um, and this one, we're going to try and talk a little bit about uh, the getting the job done. Let's say we have a vague idea of what we want to build. Uh, what does it take to deliver the product uh, once we've decided we know what we're going to deliver? And so our first, uh, I'm going to go through and uh, introduce the speakers just before they present, so you don't forget, they're sterling records. Um, so Steve Kemp is uh, going to go first. He's going to talk about zero is the future. You're going to see a trend through all of these presentations, and zero comes up a lot. Um, so Steve is a, as a, as a principal of RDH Building Science. Um, he's, uh, been in, he's the senior person that we have for energy and sustainability at RDH Building Science. I've known Steve since the early days when he escaped Nova Scotia and came to Ontario to work on an energy modeling and analysis firm. Uh, and we've shared and swapped war stories about trying to make low carbon, low energy buildings that don't leak or rot for all that time. And so he's uh, got 20 years of building experience. He's a fellow of LEED. I don't even think you wrote that down on here. He's a LEED fellow for all of his contributions that he has done to getting LEED to be a real program in Canada. Uh, and he's worked on a whole range of mechanical systems, renewable energy, and is one of the first actual uh, green engineers that I'd met on the mechanical side who totally understood the need to make a system that included the enclosure and the occupants. It seems to be more and more people are getting that now. It's not one of the systems, it's all of them, but you were one of the first. So take it away, Steve. Okay. Um, okay, well, that's the voice. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, as we said, we're all going to talk about different uh, uh, senses of zero. I I'm going to talk about it from a, a very high level. Uh, where are we now? Where are we going? Why are we going? Uh, and why a heat pump is probably in your future. <laughs> um, so work this out. Whoop, wrong way. Ah, down is forward. There we go. Uh, so where are we and where do we need to go? This is some of the information that's coming from Environment Canada in terms of the historical GHG emissions for uh, all of Canada. Way down the bottom right, there's a little dot. This is where we've committed to go. Um, the red line is, was the business as usual. Uh, the blue area, the blue line, this is where uh, the federal government thought we could get with the, uh, basically the policies in, pla policies in place uh, at end of December 2017. Uh, of course, that really fell short. Uh, so then we came up with new policies uh, that are now on the green line still not quite getting there. And of course, this is people predicting the future, which is always difficult to predict. But the hope is that this will come true and, uh, and that we will actually start achieving or coming close to achieving our targets. Um, I'm gonna spend as much time on this graph, but this is just breaking up where is that carbon coming from. Uh, buildings is on that, it's a light gray line. I have a pointer. Uh, here, I highlight where it's going, where it's projected, which is, being projected is a rather flat line. Now, also on that graph is electricity production, and a good majority of our electricity production in, in, in Canada is actually going to feed our buildings. That is going down, or at least projected to go down. Uh, so that's some good news. But when I look at that, that kind of frightens me a little bit that we're not projecting, other than electricity, big, big gains in building energy greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the reason why it concerns me is, is this graph here. Uh, I don't want to get too much into motherhood statements, but the carbon we have in the atmosphere is going to affect our climate right now for the next 40 years, which is to say all the, car all the global warming we're feeling right now is stuff that was emitted in up to 1970. And that graph is showing how much more carbon we've emitted since then. We've yet to fully feel its effects on our climate, which is to say, we got some challenges ahead. We need some, you, we've already mentioned the new IPCC report. This is kind of connected to that. Uh, but nonetheless, adaptation is going to be needed. We're going to be looking at uh, more flooding events. We're going to be looking at more forest fire events. I, we were working on a project in uh, Nanaimo as a hospital 
uh, and their biggest worry about climate change is when there's a forest fire, which is going to happen more often in Vancouver Island, how do you keep all that smoke from coming into the hospital? So these are some of the adaptations that, that people in buildings are considering. Um, at the same time, we've been having energy codes in North America and in Canada since the 1970s. Uh, basically, the first one was ASHRAE, uh, 1975, uh, somewhat in response to the uh, original oil crisis. Uh, it was updated, made my glasses off, <laughs> uh, in 1989. This is about the time I got into the industry, ASHRAE version 1989, 19.1, was the first energy code I got to work with. Uh, in 1997, this is the red line, uh, Canada introduced its first energy code, and what you're seeing on this graph is like actually about three or four different consultants combining all their data and trying to say, how do these codes perform relative to each other, and more importantly, how it's the success of versions. And one thing you can say in this graph is that we're certainly rapidly crank things down. Uh, uh, the National Energy Code of Canada is on a five-year release cycle. Um, Richard earlier was mentioning he was on, I'm on the same committee as well as uh, uh, Andy's in the room here. Um, we have a mandate from the government that says, thou shalt give us a National Energy Code of Canada that is net zero ready by 2030. And then it's up to provinces to adopt that. So these things are going to start getting cranked down pretty quickly. Um, at the same time, when we measure what's happening in real buildings, uh, and this is Statistics Canada data, it, uh, which comes out every few years. This is the newest data. It was measured in 2014, uh, mostly through surveys, uh, uh, surveys of building owners, and they basically ask them, how much energy do you use? How much gas do you use? Uh, it's a very sophisticated survey. It's, it's not just a voluntary thing. Uh, they do lots of data correction to make sure their people aren't volunteering their best children. Um, and they also asked them, by the way, when was your building built? And so this is the energy used in 2014, uh, categorized by how old the buildings are. And for some reason, if your building was built in the 1980s, it was the best. <laughs> We're not quite sure why. Maybe it's because since the 1980s, we've replaced the boiler, because that happens. Right? All these, most of these, especially the older buildings, have been renovated. But it doesn't come with any data. Like, no explanation. This is just purely the data. And so it's not always easy to say what is happening. But I will say that we've had 100 years of better technologies, better lights, better boilers, better chillers, and something's going wrong because it's not completely showing up in our building stock. Um, I mean, one, thing, I mean I, one example I can give you is um, we did a study in uh, British Columbia looking at a uh, multi, multifamily building, the condo market. And the nice thing about the condo market is that almost in Vancouver is that they almost exclusively use uh, electric resistance heating, which means we can actually get on a meter, an isolated meter, what the heating load in the building is. And while windows were getting better, we were getting low-E windows and argon windows and, and leaving single-pane windows behind in the mild climate of Vancouver, we doubled how much windows were on the building. So we had some, you know, hey, we got better windows now. We can make people more comfortable. Let's add more windows. <laughs> Um, so how are some jurisdictions responding? Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, in Canada the National Energy Code of build for Buildings, which is supposed to be a national code, but it has to be adopted by provinces. Um, but there's been a couple of cities in Canada and, and the province of British Columbia have said, enough is enough. We need to change how we're measuring performance of buildings. We need to change how these energy codes work. Um, and the one I'm going to concentrate on is, is going to be the Toronto Green Standard, uh, but most of these are roughly the same. Uh, there's also the British Columbia uh, step code, which is being adopted. Uh, the city of Vancouver rezoning targets. Uh, so that if you're, uh, if, if you're in the city of Vancouver and you're taking this plot of land that was single family homes, it's too valuable to be single family homes anymore. We're going to put a six story uh, multifamily building on it. Uh, then you're under a rezoning law because you're going to change the rezoning policy for that site. And they put all these extra restrictive restrictions on you. Or, aspirations on you, I should say. Uh, you can look at passive house, but you can also look at minimum absolute energy targets for both energy and GHG emissions for your building. Uh, and there's now the Canadian zero, uh, Canadian zero Carbon Building Standard. I think we talked this morning a little bit about Evolve. I have a slide in that building as well. Um, and that came out in 2017. What's common about all of these uh, uh, new energy target and new uh, policies is that they all use absolute energy as the metric of which thou shalt do no worse than this. It's like miles per gallon on your car, liters per 100 kilometers. 
Um, and so just to concentrate on Toronto in particular, what I did like what they did is they picked clearly defined goals of what they wanted to do and then put metrics around them. And they said, what are our problems? We're using too much energy. I want you know, that wind turbine that is providing energy to 100 homes, I want to be able to provide energy to 200 homes. I want that hydro dam which provides uh, energy for a small city, why can't it provide enough energy for a larger city? And so that's all about energy conservation, and that's what we brought in, uh, the Brit they, City of Toronto brought in this energy use intensity target. And the market, especially the existing building market, and, 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 and much of the, uh, Canada is slowly coming around and starting talking about EUI. How many kilowatt hours per square foot? How many kilowatt hours per square meter? If you're the Canadian government, you're talking gigajoules per square meter, and if you're an American, you talk KBTU per square foot. Uh, but they're all the same thing. Uh, the other thing Toronto wanted to do was uh, to address uh, passive survivability um, and comfort and also investing in the enclosure. I, I've, as John mentioned, I spent a lot of time on, on the LEAP uh, side of things. Um, and I kind of like to summarize my career as uh, I got out of school, it was seemed clear by everything I learned in school that you had to, to, to reduce energy use in buildings, you had to start with the enclosure. That's where most of the loads come from. And yet when I looked at what was happening in the industry, we were designing particularly bad mechanical systems. They were just simply set up to simultaneously heat and cool, especially in the commercial side of buildings. Uh, and so I spent much of my first part of my career uh, basically working with design teams to improve mechanical systems, doing exhaust air heat recovery, doing better boilers, better uh, delivery systems for, for heating and cooling and building. Um, and now that I, I've, I've worked out past that, I finally see the industry finally saying it's time to do better on the enclosure. Uh, and so the Charity of Toronto is saying, let's put a metric around that. Uh, put a metric that if it's buildings well insulated enough, the next time the power goes out, you don't have to leave your condo building immediately because it's going to be too cold by the time the sun sets. Um, and then the last metric they put on again, because we care about it, is greenhouse gas emissions. You know, ultimately that's what we're after. Climate change is a challenge. How many kilograms per square meter is your building allowed to admit? So there they are. There's a whole bunch of numbers up there. The only number I want you to pay attention to are the red ones. They come into effect in the city of Toronto in 2030. And for all intents and purposes, this is practically passive house energy performance. So in 2030, if all goes well and the, the politicians stick to their guns, uh, if you're going to build a multifamily building, a commercial office building, or a retail building in the city of Toronto, it's supposed to be passive house and when, when you go for building permit in 2030. Um, but they're bringing it in, in tiers, so basically there's a lower tier available, not as stringent a tier available now, that will eventually drop off, the next tier will be the most stringent, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, so what does it mean for how I'm heating my building? Uh, as I mentioned, it's probably going to be heat pumps. Um, one, it's really hard to get to those lower energy performances when you're using a fossil fuel heating system because they can never be better than 100% efficient. Um, also, we happen to live uh, in Canada, uh, and with some exceptions in some jurisdictions, but that's quickly changing, and I'll show you that graph. Most of the provinces, uh, most of the population in Canada lives in a place where our electricity is green enough that if you switch to heat pumps right now, you're automatically emitting less greenhouse gases than if you, you uh, worked on a heat pump. We do have a challenge around pricing though. So what's on this graph is what's called the spark gap. How many, more, how many times more expensive per unit of energy is electricity versus gas? And right now in a lot of our provinces, we are seeing, especially here in Ontario, we are seeing spark gaps of up to five to one. If you add $100 a ton G, uh, 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 carbon tax to that, it drops down to three to one here in Ontario. And, or actually almost two and a half, just, just under three. And if you get below that black line, that's when the cost of a heat pump is less expensive to operate than your condensing furnace or your condensing boiler. So we have some challenges, we have some provinces where this works out wonderfully already. Um, in particular, uh, uh, <coughs> Whichever ones are low here. <laughs> um, but uh, for the most part here in Ontario, we, we, we need this carbon tax to make the economic argument. Um, because you can have a spark gap, you can also have a CO2 gap. <laughs> and so it's the same type of metric. What is the CO2 emissions per unit of energy consumed? Uh, and again, uh, this is, you can see 
all our most populous provinces, Ontario, Quebec, uh, British Columbia, very, very, very low emissions for electricity. It's really just a few provinces that have challenges, Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, and Nova Scotia. Again, if you're below that line, you're better off on a heat pump uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. But as I said, this is rapidly changing. This is uh, data that came from WSP, uh, published by CAGBC. Um, and again, these are predictions about the future. Uh, but most of our provincial grids have committed to significantly decarbonizing. Uh, Nova Scotia just finished uh, putting a connection to Newfoundland, or is in the middle of finishing a connection to Newfoundland. Goes across the ocean, onto the rock, uh, up through to, I believe, up to uh, Labrador. And, uh, and there's a hydro plant. Uh, and so Nova Scotia is slowly phasing out their coal plants uh, as this hydro plant comes on. Uh, and it works out that even by 2027, pretty much if predictions hold true and if the current commitments hold true, uh, every province in Canada will be, have a cleaner enough electric grid that it makes more sense to switch to uh, heat pumps. 2027 is not that far away. In terms of developer building cycles, it's like your third next project or second next project. It might even be your next project. Uh, and we, you know, the building we designed today is going to be around for 20 years, or hopefully at least 20 years, but it could be 50 or 60, 100 years. So really quickly, those who don't know what heat pumps are, um, heat, as we all know, moves from hot to cold by itself. So if you, turns out if you squeeze a fluid, and we call that fluid a refrigerant, if you squeeze it, it gets warm. If you expand it, it gets cold. As long as you squeeze it hard enough that it's warmer than the thing you're trying to heat, and as long as you expand it cold enough that it's cold enough to suck heat or the thing you're trying to suck heat out of, you have a heat pump. You just got to put energy into it to move heat from cold to hot. And if you're on one side, it's a heat pump. And if you're on the other side, it's, a it's a air conditioning. It's like putting your refrigerator in the window, and which side of the refrigerator are you sitting on? Um, we have lots of ways to make heat pumps work. This is uh, the competitor, I guess, to Evolve. Um, as one of my projects this was uh, my first day of work was doing the interview for this project with my uh, architect client. Uh, this is the Joy Center for Innovation and Partnership. Uh, it is also net positive. It is net carbon. Net, is carbon sink. Uh, we have enough PV that we're offsetting more natural gas than the building will ever consume. Uh, and in fact, uh, th there's numbers roughly work out to our embodied carbon is 500 kilograms per square meter of floor plate of this building. That's how much carbon went into the concrete and steel uh, and in the enclosure. Um, but we're paying that back at the rate of, I think, about 18 uh, kilograms per square meter per year. And so we're going to be basically uh, carbon positive in 27 years which just tells you how much embodied carbon there is in building material. So we have another problem to solve after energy. Uh, but this building uses what's called a ground source heat pump. So essentially, if you can see up here, uh, we drill lots of wells in the ground, and we use the fact that the ground is not too hot, not too cold. We suck the heat in and out of the ground as we need. That's one way to do it. Uh, another way to run heat pumps, this is uh, WISE, uh, where you're going to be moving to. Sorry, um, <laughs> Evolve 1, where you'll be moving to. Uh, I'm so jealous, they're doing open injection wells. Two wells. And basically you pump water out of the ground, you run it through your heat pump, you pump the water back into the ground. Uh, the aquifer they happen to be using here is well below our drinking aquifer in this region. Uh, matter of fact, it's, it's uh, salt water, it turns out to be. And it's not very pleasant water either. Um, they had some... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Adrian left already. They had some permitting issues, but it all worked out. Uh, very low expensive way to get a ground source heat pump to work. And then finally, we have the advent of low, uh, low ambient cold climate heat pumps, uh, air source heat pumps. Uh, so now we can just pull the heat out of the air. We can pull the heat out of the air down to most minus 25 even now with Mitsubishi's and uh, some of LG's equipment. Uh, and the race is on. These, are, these systems are, are, they actually use refrigerant, refrigerant and pump it around the building to heat and cool the building. Um, the race is on for low ambient air to water heat pumps. There's several manufacturers working on this. Uh, but the race is on to find more and more ways we can heat and cool our buildings with just heat pump technologies. So how will this all change? This is what we build now. <laughs> How will Toronto Green Center and BC Step Code uh, and the City of Vancouver change things? Uh, with the advent of that uh, Teddy, we're going to see more opacity in our buildings. 
Uh, we're going to see more renewable energy on top of our buildings. We're going to see certainly more insulation. Uh, air tightness is showing up as part of all of these metrics. Uh, so we're going to start seeing larger and larger buildings going through air tightness testing. Uh, reducing thermal bridging, you've heard, heard some of this this morning, dealing with ther uh, thermal breaks. Low carbon materials have to start happening. Um, we need to be greening the grid, and we need to be doing more greening of the grid. Uh, certainly Ontario has done well in, 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 ba in basically retiring our last of our coal plants, but we have other provinces that have challenges, but they are committing to do it. And just some examples of more what high performance architecture will look like. But things are changing. And we need to get that number all the way at the end of the energy code to zero. And we are working on that. And these changes are coming, as Craig, who started out the day, they're coming rapidly and probably faster than they ever had at any time in our industry before. And that's all I had. Thank you, Steve. Um, so our next distinguished speaker uh, is uh, Rob Quattrocio. I don't know how to say that properly in Italian, uh, but uh, Rob's been involved with Ellis Don for uh, quite a few years. I've known him for a long time uh, since he was part of the Building Sciences Division at Ellis Don, and he's worked his way uh, up through that so that he's now the Building and Materials Science Manager at Ellis Don. Um, he leads a, a, a multidisciplinary team uh, who are trying to mitigate the risks associated with new technology innovation. So uh, he's a frequent uh, attendee at conferences like this, trying to identify uh, technologies, and then he goes back to his hole somewhere and uh, tries to assess the risks so that he can advise uh, the people who are building these buildings on how to manage them. Um, so he's a graduate of the University of Toronto. He's on the CSA committee uh, S478, which is the design for durability in buildings, which is actually, someone did mention the life cycle, and it's a pretty big deal to have uh, that kind of thinking about this as well. And he also uh, donates his time by being part of the Ontario Building uh, Envelope Council as being on their board of directors. So Rob, I'll, I'll let you take it away. Uh, thanks, John. So I, I literally uh, just got back from Italy like two days ago, and it was the first time I've heard my name pronounced correctly in like ever. <laughs> but I, I appreciate the effort, John. For the record, it's quattro ciocchi, okay? It means four drunks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm uh, excited to be here. Uh, why don't I just get going? I, I want to mainly focus on uh, basically uh, tag along from what, what, what Steve was talking about, but more on, on the challenges, obstacles that we see as a constructor and, and out there in, in the industry on, on getting to these low carbon goals and, and low, zero, uh, 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 low, zero, low energy buildings, I should say. Um, so am I operating this correctly? Okay. So uh, just a little bit about the group that John kind of described. It's, uh, the larger name is Construction Sciences Group, and kind of just an overview, we kind of live in the area between design and, and the construction. We're like a technical group. We provide input in terms of uh, helping to select systems. Uh, we analyze supply chains for uh, various manufacturers. We get into the nitty-gritty details on projects, depending on the complexity. And we're like a technical resource for our group, uh, for our company, for our projects to help mitigate risk and provide value-added service to our clients. So that's kind of the angle that I'm, I'm taking this from. Um, so the first thing I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about is, is the, the, the main theme here is building for higher performance, mostly uh, targeted towards uh, high-rise construction. Uh, with the progress, with progressive new building standards coming aboard, like Steve uh, touched on, and the uh, step code in uh, BC, and the tiered system in Toronto, and those kind of things, um, it's, it's, it's time we start elevating our game and, and start looking at strategies on, on how we're going to hit these, these targets, um, especially for high-rise. High That's where the real challenge is. Um, where traditionally uh, we would use you know, unitized systems, um, you can't go ahead and, and, and start uh, building uh, opaque areas, stick-built systems for 50-story buildings. You'll never hit the schedule. So, um, so higher performance. Uh, this tradi traditionally, you know, as, we, uh, as we, things we'd see in, in downtown Toronto and some of the major centers, as we go through the spectrums, I mean, we have a pretty low thermal performing system here with a typical window wall system, uh, small width uh, unit panels, 
a uh, lot of framing, a lot of thermal bridges. Uh, you know, and then we get progressively a little better with unitized curtain wall systems. Um, you know, you add triple glazing, helps you out a little bit. Even if you add uh, a bunch of spray foam behind the spandrel panels, you're still not going to get to where we need to get to. But this is how we've built our, our towers in unitized fashion uh, for various reasons, obviously schedule and, and cost. Uh, but now we're getting into these buildings, R19, R20. We, we have clients uh, asking for R25 effective uh, wall assemblies. So, I mean, you're not going to get that with these traditional systems. So uh, I thought I'd add this photo. This is a, a proposed uh, building development in Vancouver, and it's two 40-story uh, passive house targeted buildings. And you, you want to kind of notice the New York kind of architecture feel with all the kind of setbacks and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, increase the surface area. That'll, that'll help you with the, the passive house, right? Um, so, so, I mean, this is the kind of thing we're looking at. So, challenge is how do, how do we get there? Uh, you know, you can't use traditional methods. Uh, you can't sacrifice cost. Uh, I don't think any of our clients are going to give us another six months or a year to build these things. And, and the quality has to be equal. If not, it has to be better. But not equal. It has to be better to meet these targets. So part of the answer, I think, is, is off-site construction. And, and I like this slide. I don't think John likes it too much. And we chatted about it a, a little bit earlier. Uh, basically, you know, building a house on site makes as much sense as building a car uh, in your driveway. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the point I was getting at was you want to try to take advantage of any efficiencies you can get. If you have repetition on a building, it makes no sense to actually keep doing it in the field where the quality is going to be less. Um, but I, I kind of like this slide. It just uh, kind of hits home a bit. But when I'm talking about off-site construction in, in for the envelope to meet these, these standards, I'm talking about large format panels, and some of you have probably seen them. They, they've been in, you know, in, in use for some time in Europe um, and in northeastern United States, Boston and, and New York. And, and you know, we don't have, like I said, the, the, the schedule to, to build, these, uh, build these systems in stick format. So, and plus, it's hard to inspect for quality uh, a stick built system on these high rise buildings. So why not build it where you can actually monitor the quality in a controlled environment and, and build these opaque areas, include all your assemblies in there, including your, your windows and what have you, any type of cladding, right? Oh, oh okay, sorry, missed that. So these are formed, essentially cold form steel frames or uh, you know, I'm used to I'm used to the button. Uh, or aluminum extrusion, you can actually make these like a unitized curtain wall frame uh, with a perimeter uh, unitized uh, frame with a gasket system. There's sheathing, uh, an AVB uh, type material, uh, mineral wool insulation, typically airspace, punch windows within a variety of cladding types, triple glaze, whatever you need. And they and they install and connect much like traditional curtain wall systems. Some have, like I said a unitized uh, uh, approach where it's an extruded system. Some are kind of just butted together and sealed with, with caulking, some of the, the earlier versions, less performing. Um, and the size is pretty much limited to, to the transport, how, how big you can transport these things. But what we've seen is the max is about 30 foot wide and typically a floor height um, in, in height. This is an example of, of, a, of a plant of one of the, the manufacturers in the US that, that really really has this down to a science. You, you, you might want to, you can tell it kind of looks like an a, a auto manufacturing facility with production lines and you know, very sequenced work, enclosed area, um, controlled environment, it's controlled rate of production. Um, it's, it's really a really efficient way of, of doing these things. So here's an, uh, you know, the cold form steel is welded together. Uh, can also come, like I said, with an extruded perimeter frame similar to a unitized curtain wall. Um, then these systems all come together uh, in the plant. I mean, you put everything in there, and it's, it gets shipped to the plant uh, to the to the field. Here's the the guys putting on uh, on your sheathing, getting uh, ready for the AVB material to go on. As you can see, it's a lot easier to do this with the panel laying on the ground rather than 30 floors up in the air on a vertical surface. Um, it's obviously a lot safer too. 
This is, uh, okay, so then they'll use a gantry crane to lift these massive mega panels up when produ uh, producing to transport them to the various uh, uh, points in the, in the plant and to transport in the field. It's generally done like just in time construction. You don't have, especially in these downtown urban centers, you don't have the lay down areas to, to store these panels. Typically in, in curtain wall uh, systems, you load up the, the floors with the man and material hoist and then it gets erected from there. You don't have that luxury with, uh, with these. This is an example of a um, panel that was used for the uh, Brock Commons project in Vancouver, which is the tallest mass timber project in Canada, I, I think it still is. Uh, the pan panels were manufactured by a Canadian company in, uh, in BC, and this was their first real stab at producing something like this. And, and I think there was a bit of a learning curve, but. Uh, but again, it, it, it was really successful from what I understand in terms of installation speed and enclosing the building, especially with a mass timber building, you want to enclose it as obviously as soon as you can to keep it uh, watertight. Um, joints between these panels, like I said, it was their first stab at it, so it, was, it wasn't a unitized system, they weren't interlocking systems. There was a closure panel and it was sealed with a cock joint from the interior for uh, accessibility, uh, ease and all that. Um, Install is, is typically done with the tower crane, um, depending on the, the size and the weight of the panels, but it can be done with a mobile crane as well. This can be an issue, you know, a logistical issue. As you know, with the high-rise construction, the tower crane is like the lifeblood of the project, so you can't really tie up the crane to start doing your envelope. So from what we hear a lot of times in projects in the States, they'll work on agreements where they'll take over the crane at 3 o'clock and work till 8 o'clock. But you know, it's, it's nothing that can't be, uh, can't be overcome. So this is an example of a, of a building, a residential building in uh, Brooklyn, New York, 300 Ashland Place. Uh, it was built by one of the two companies we know of in the States that does this type of system really well. Uh, they're called uh, Eastern Exterior Wall Systems in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, so this was gasketed unitized system, 190,000 square feet. And as you can see, it's not, totally planar geometry. It's not a simple building. Um, I, was, uh, I saw the, the design engineer uh, present at a recent conference, and he talked about the complexities and the, and the, uh, uh, the sophistication and, and the equipment and software they needed to develop the system, but, uh, but they were able to do it and to prove that you don't necessarily have to, um, the buildings don't have to necessarily be flat, planar geometry, boring buildings to use this type of uh, assembly. So, uh, it was a real, a real success story. This, you might have heard about, this is the, the tallest certified passive house project in the world. It's, at, um, it's the house at Cornell Tech. Same company, uh, Eastern Exterior Wall Systems. And this one also was a uh, unitized frame with a triple glazed window. And, and they were able to achieve R19 effective. So now you're getting in the neighborhood of where we need to be. But you know, it's not the easiest thing in the, in the world to, to, to do. So, I mean, you have your, your definite positives. The quality of fabrication, like I touched on, it's in a plant-controlled environment. You can't beat that. Uh, the schedule, um, you can actually ramp this thing up. And like I said, just in time construction, you can install at least one floor uh, uh, per week, if not more. Uh, generally, you're looking at a, a one-week cycle uh, for tower construction. But you can probably do more than that with, uh, with this type of system. Uh, gasketed system um, eliminates exterior work and out there doing cock joints. Also helps with maintenance and, and that kind of stuff and staining down the road. Higher thermal performance that we need, obviously. Single source uh, or one throat to choke, like we, uh, as we like to say. Uh, all the material gets, gets, gets sent to a plant, the windows, the cladding, the insulation, everything. And they're responsible for putting the finished product together, bringing it to site and, and clipping it in. Less waste, uh, obviously, and it's, it's much safer. But here's the real, the, the big obstacle, the real crux that, that I want to bring is, is right now in Canada, there, we're lacking that, that real mature, established supply chain in building these types of systems. Like I said, there's, there's two uh, companies in the States that, that have this down to a science. But right now, uh, it, it, it hasn't been really uh, a fit to use U the U.S. Uh, companies. Obviously, cost is, a, is an issue, uh, transporting them to Canada, plus the exchange rate. Uh, there are some companies in Canada that are getting into it, preliminary, 
uh, looking into it, uh, doing some engineering, and, and I think they're coming along with it. But right now, uh, I think that's still a, a couple years away. Um, and th their need for this, as Steve talks about, I mean, this is now. We, we need this now. So, um, so I, th I think the, the, the major curtain wall companies or those, those kind of pre-manufactured uh, companies would be a natural fit for, for this kind of thing. So, I mean, if anybody's uh, looking at getting into this, uh, I'll, leave you, uh, I'll leave you a card because this is a definite need right now in the industry. Um, costs, like I said, you know, uh, supply and demand, uh, uh, economies of scale. If once we get more manufacturers, uh, the cost will come down and it'll, it'll become a, a, a comparable um, way to build things. Um, there is some limitations in building geometry, obviously, um, and you want to get as much repetition as you can, just like you would with a curtain wall system, and that makes it more efficient. But like I showed you on, on the other previous slide, it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be a boring flat building either. And the important thing is with this type of, of, of assembly and construction, you really need to be committed right from the beginning of design with the, the, the client, the designer, uh, the constructor. You can't bring this, in, bring this to the table after the fact. I mean, this is really, really has to happen right away. But this I see as, as the, way, the way of the future to build our buildings, to get the thermal performance we need, uh, and to build them with the, with the same time frame that we're building right now. So it's a major need. Um, next thing I want to talk about is building, building towards change in, in terms of, of codes. Um, in a lot of cases, the technology for, for low carbon, low energy buildings, I mean, it's there on the market right now. Uh, the stumbling blocks a lot of times come from other sources, including antiquated codes or, or regulations that no longer uh, accurately, accurately reflect the state of the industry, right? So th there is a pressing need to modernize some of our codes. We need to ask, are these requirements still relevant? Uh, a lot of them were developed 50 plus years ago. Are they still relevant today? We need to replace clauses that limit innovation. I mean, innovation is, is, is the lifeblood of these green buildings that we're, we're looking towards. So uh, anything um, that can help us uh, get past that is definitely something worth, uh, worth looking into. And we need to support changes with evidence-based criteria, including actual physical testing showing results and, and supplement that with, uh, with modeling. And that's, that's the only way you're really going to get something to, to change in the, in the codes. So I'll give you an example. Right now, this clause is, is in the MBC and OBC and I think a bunch of other provincial building codes as well. But it, but it talks about, it limits the use of combustible windows in buildings that are required to be built of non-combustible construction. So essentially, windows such as PVC or fiberglass. And it limits their use. And, and these are the two main things uh, I want to talk about is the two main subsections of the clause are windows in exterior walls in contiguous stories are separated by not less than one meters of non-combustible construction. And the aggregate area of openings in exterior wall face of a fire compartment is not more than 40% of the area of the wall face. So these are the criteria you have to meet in order to use these types of, of windows in non-combustible construction. So, you know, right now, like classification of window framing materials, as I said here, uh, based on combustibility is, is, is problematic. I, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's based on, on a test, uh, S, uh, S144, I, sh I should say. Um, and, and it's based on temperature rise and flaming and loss of mass during test. It doesn't distinguish if it ignites readily, does a fire spread or diminish. Uh, etc. Um, since these, oh, sorry. Uh, since these mitigation measures are in place, I mean, it limits to what we can actually do with these products, and, and they are higher thermally performing products than our tr traditional metal uh, type windows. So code restrictions. This situation it, it doesn't really exist in ever in in other developed Western uh, 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 countries. Uh, PVC and fiberglass windows are used elsewhere all over the world in this type of construction for their obvious advantages, uh, but we're not able to take advantage of that in, in Canada because of this clause. Uh, as a result, there's no real market right now for this type of, of, of uh, systems or these types of systems in any real large scale other than small residential low-rise buildings. I know in the States, uh, Cascadia is one of these uh, fiberglass uh, window developers. 
they do a ton of work in the States uh, because they're not limited, to, limited with, the, with these types of restrictions. Um, the last couple of years, the, the uh, National Research uh, Canada conducted a study with 10, they got a group of 10 window manufacturers, PVC and fiberglass window manufacturers, to, to, to put together some testing, to create some data, to try to uh, put together a case for a, for a change to the code. Um, there was lots of fire testing, including the S134, which is the standard method of fire test of exterior wall assemblies. Um, and the results appear to be promising. So here's some photos of, of that. So here's the, the basic mock-up chamber uh, with the fiberglass window. This is an actual fiberglass window wall assembly, and that's the, the fire opening. And then you see the, 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 the frame ignite, uh, but it, extingu it extinguishes itself prior to hitting. There's a, a five meter limit above the fire hole, which it can't pass. So it passes that, uh, it, it fails the test. So as you can see, that's the line right there. The green line is the five meter mark, and it's well below that where it extinguishes itself. So it passed that test. And here's the same test performed on an aluminum window. They, they took, from what I understand in the study, they took uh, some typical aluminum uh, uh, window systems and applied the same test. And both of them passed, and both of them passed, and they're, and they're both safe. Um, so now, uh, in Canada, one of the leading code consultants uh, is, is comfortable preparing alternate solution reports for Cascadia window wall. This is the, the wall that was tested in this. Based on the results of this test, they're comfortable putting these alternate solutions together. And one of these alternate solutions has already been accepted for uh, retrofit project by the city of Vancouver. So it can be accepted, but it's, it's another step in the road. You have to take time to, to develop these, uh, the testing and alternate solutions just to get accepted on projects. And it's a big stumbling block where, you know, if you use these systems uh, versus typical uh, windows, they'll, they'll give you almost maybe 80% or double the, the R value of a typical uh, aluminum system. So, and it's important to note that if you base it on solely on combustibility, then every aluminum window with a thermal break would not pass that either. There's no thermal break that will pass that combustibility uh, test as well. So really, what are we, what are we really uh, talking about here? So what's next in terms of trying to change that, that code is um, a formal application has been submitted to, to the Code Council, and it's under review for potential adoption in the next code cycle, which is 2020. So, Code cycles generally work in five-year uh, periods, so it does take time, right? Uh, this is a great example of, of when industry gets together, and they see an issue, and they come together for, for the betterment of all, and, and we need more of this. This is just one example uh, of, of this kind of thing. Um, for now, we, we, we need to rely on alternate solutions path. Um, now, will, will change come quickly enough in this rapidly changing landscape? Like I talked about, if we're waiting to, to do all this testing, these testing programs, and then get into the next code cycle, we're talking about five-year periods at a time. So uh, we know our targets are coming uh, uh, quick and fast, um, so we need to, to develop uh, solutions a lot quicker. So that's a real stumbling block. Last thing I want to talk about is, is building for optimization. and, and by no means am I an expert in building systems operations, but I, I was speaking to our en energy and digital guys back at the office, and I thought this was very important uh, to include because it's a big part of the equation. Um, we can have all the, the newest technology built into our buildings, but if it's not operated properly, you, you'll never optimize your performance, and you're basically uh, not gaining what you're trying to, to establish. So this slide just talks about, in general, I'm not going to go through it all. It's, it's some challenges that, that our energy guys face, uh, mainly with P3s where uh, we're basically running and operating the building, and your, your energy targets, I mean, you, you, have to, you have to guarantee your energy performance. So this talks about step-by-step -step some of the challenges we face, but what I, what I really wanted for our purposes here, I really wanted to concentrate on the operational side of things. Um, so the big need is, is there needs to be an integrated approach right from the beginning. From the pursuit side, construction, and operations, you need to get the operations people involved right away into the design so that they know what they're dealing with, they know the complexity of the systems, and they can learn better how to fine-tune these, these buildings. 
the traditional method, though, has some drawbacks. I mean, these people don't grow on trees. They're, they're human. They uh, tend to modify some systems. If you can imagine, uh, in a building, uh, an operations manager's there. Um, somebody claim, complains that it's too cold in one area, he'll blast the heat in that one area and then maybe forget to rebalance it or whatever. You can see how much energy that, that expends rather than truly optimizing the building. So what we're getting towards now is intelligent, ready buildings. And this is some of the stuff that we're, we're doing out there right now. So, so in traditional buildings, there are, there are separate interfaces for each of the control and metering systems. Interfaces have limited mobility, operational challenges with multiple interfaces, and there's little to no understanding of how the systems affect one another. Um, so how can these buildings be optimized? So now, uh, with these intelligent or smart buildings, you, you'll get single converged backbone to bring in all your services into the building, and then you can manage it. You have a centralized location for monitoring, and what the, the goal is now, I see with, the, with, uh, with uh, owners with large portfolios, is to establish, uh, establish one main monitoring station that can that can track all their buildings at one time, so, so they see the efficiency of that. Um, and then you, 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 you get up, set up to a, a, a dashboard, where it's a, it's a building energy management information system dashboard. It allows you to track real time what your energy usage is, is uh, where, where you're improving, where you're not, oh, sorry. And, and it's a real tool now to help uh, with diagnostics and fault detection, water consumption, and all that kind of stuff. So this is, this is what's happening right now, real time. Uh, but making these smart buildings even smarter is, is stuff we're doing right now is, is, is with cloud-based technology. You're, you're getting all the information, all the, you have tons of sensors in the buildings, you get millions of data points every day. That information is, is sent to the cloud uh, where there's an algorithm that processes that and sends back an action plan to the, to the building automation system. Right? And this, then the set points are then tweaked to automatically optimize the building. And this happens you know, every minute of every day. So you're getting all these millions of data points, and it's this constant loop uh, that's actually an automated system. It's, it's autonomous. You don't need somebody to, to kind of balance out the system. So this is the kind of stuff that's happening right now. Uh, the main challenge is, uh, is now you have all this big data, they call it. Um, what can we use that for? I mean, that's what we got to start looking, looking at. You have all this data. There's got to be more applications application for it, excuse me, uh, to, to better enhance the, the building performance. Uh, so that's really where it's going to right now. But it's really cool stuff that's happening. And, and now we're getting to the point where the systems are being operated, can be operated to, to, to what they should be. So as you can see, we have some work to do. So, so let's get to it. I mean, it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to put our heads together and, and, and go for it. That's all I have. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Rob. Um, next on the chopping block is uh, Stephen Montgomery, a place he's probably used to being as a pursuits manager uh, for PCL uh, in the mechanical and electrical uh, area. Uh, he's been involved in Canadian Green Building Council, for example, as an engineer since 2003, um, and has been involved in uh, caring about not just getting a mechanical system in, but also uh, its environmental impacts. Um, being able to respond to societal legislation and other pressures that modify the design decisions that you get to make. So I'm going to let uh, Stephen take it away. Okay, just check my mic here. Um, thank you very much for coming. I'm thank you for, very grateful to be here today. It's, um, it's an honor to speak with you guys at the beginning of architectural engineering as a faculty. Um, I, for one, was very excited to hear about it. Um, just the thought of people soaking um, in four years of, of buildings as a thing. Um, I was just over speaking with the faculty staff earlier and, and came up with the thought, you know, no one has to explain themselves about what our, uh, aerospace engineering is. Um, common people seem to understand rocket ships better than they understand the buildings that they're in every day. Um, good luck explaining it. I think in another 10, 15 years, people are going to start understanding. Um, but uh, good on you, and I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I wanted to speak today about complexity. Um, sort of cut through some of the jargon. There is a lot of jargon in this industry right now. People are, are tripping over themselves to be the first to mention um, something new. 
Um, that has its own stunting effect in our discussions. Um, so uh, I just wanted to sort of boil down a few concepts, keep it very simple. You won't have me going into any uh, charts or diagrams. Um, just, just look at, at, at how things went. Um, now, at, at PCL, I was invited to be um, a building systems coordinator for a number of years. And this was after four years of being a uh, design engineer. Um, and, and so coming over to the construction industry was, was sort of along my lines of passion. I wanted to know more about how these things were happening more than just what we were, uh, how they were designed. Um, something had to be more, uh, more complex than all this. So um, at PCL, as I've, as I've evolved, I've also been asked to be a sustainable uh, construction advisor. And that made my head spin a little bit. How do, I, how do I speak to this in an intelligent way? How do I bring something to each team um, without being the M&E guy again um, in a way that, that means something? Especially if I'm going to speak intelligently, what, what's the history of all this stuff? So I apologize for naming my, uh, my generation. I was born in 77, that weird micro generation that we're all talking about nowadays. But um, I look back and we start with the Industrial Revolution and the fact that uh, the environmental fallout started happening as soon as we really learned how to crank uh, carbon into the atmosphere uh, at alarming rates. And um, yet it wasn't until 1900 that something can't cr cross somebody's mind to do something about it. And at first it was just, we're not going to do this everywhere. Um, so moving ahead, after the 1960s, it seemed like that wasn't going to be enough and that what was happening elsewhere was really going to be a big enough problem to bring down the hole, regardless of what you conserved. Uh, so regulation happened from then till present, and then what's happening now is we're starting to find a way to boil down all these concerns into one way to measure pollution, where we can all talk, trade, discuss, measure, um, and make an impact. It's, it's as simple as creating a language so that we can talk about it in intelligent terms. So going back through a timeline, there's my industrial revolution. In 1800, Alexander von Humboldt was crazy enough to suggest that humans might be able to affect climate change. And again, almost a century later, we started preserving. In 1909, Theodore Roosevelt invited Canada and Mexico to a conservation conference, a very different relationship we had with the Americans back then. Um, the crazy ideas that they discussed were don't overcut forests, use organic fertilizer, and recycle. We all know how that went. Uh, in 1911, Parks Canada became a thing, and again, just naming some of the, the things that happened in the 60s, I didn't want to get too far into it. Um, if you ran, remember Randy Newman at all, I, I had a little blip up there of, of his song about the Cuyahoga River catching fire in Ohio, a 13th time. Um, I guess the first 12 times they didn't really hear about it, the 13th time it was starting to become a big deal as this river that was flowing literally crude oil um, would periodically catch fire. So these sorts of things started making people realize that Banff is not enough to fix the planet. And people started getting quite upset about it. People like Greenpeace started showing up in Vancouver in 71. And provinces, ministries all over Canada set up acts to protect the environment. And that started to complicate buildings. The brunt of it at first fell to Steve's industry, the designers who had to go into designing better equipment, using different chemicals. Um, different means to deliver the same thing as buildings and urbanization was continuing to happen. Um, these complexities all hit them. Um, I don't want to say it didn't hit construction, it did. In the 80s, PCL began to hire and train people for systems coordination. The notion of this scope is big enough that uh, we need somebody here to sit in between uh, the various parties and make sure that, that systems are properly enshrined. No longer do we have a cave and, and, and a little fan. We, we have complex uh, anatomies in our buildings um, that we're now capping off with a, with a brain, a thinking, living brain. So, um, of course, at first it was something of a party. Nowadays it's getting a little bit more like we're rushing through our lunch to get back to the next problem. I've buzzed my hair. In 1982, Microsoft graced us with Microsoft Excel. And we used that for every kind of complexity we could throw it at. And we're still doing it today. It's a great piece of software, and I won't slag it. It's just that it's, it's found its place, and stretching it any further is not going to help us much. And we mentioned a number of times today, in 1997, the first Model National Energy Code came out. That started the Canadian Building Improvement Program, where a small amount of money could go to someone in the... Uh, um, in the project team that was usually determined uh, at some point. Um, 
you know, and these, these sorts of programs were all adding to the complexity of the, of, uh, of the industry heading into 2000. And so again, I wanted to boil it down into a, a classic engineering hopeful thought, and that what we're facing here is, is complexity, and engineers love that. They love to respond to complexity, um, and that, that response has been building science. So what did, what did the, the solution look like as it took shape from designers and design firms? Um, we started seeing more control devices. We started getting more into integrated project delivery. The thought of maybe we should interact with our, uh, with our fellow building professionals differently. Um, I recall as a designer coming in near Christmas time, and one of my managers, Kel, was all dressed up. I said, you know, what are you dressed up for today? I mean, you've, you've been pretty relaxed the last few weeks. And he smiled, and he sat me down, and he explained how he was going from desk to desk to desk of all of his fellow partners to get his bills, get their bills outstanding from all their favorite architects. And he was going to go from office to office to office to office just to let everyone in the architectural world know what was outstanding. So this was sort of some of the... Oh, sorry, I'm just going to grab a, pull a sip of water here. This was sort of some of the uh, experiences that I ran into at first, um, but these were all improving. We were learning to talk differently. We were learning, we were setting up uh, delivery methods that would have us thinking, speaking, and approaching design differently. Um, that moved, of course, into IP-enabled valves, dampers, etc. All these sorts of devices that we mentioned, they're starting to be connected to networks as networks um, began to be more prevalent. At first, control systems installed their own networks. Now they're being converged onto a, a main building network. Uh, but nevertheless, this is all you know, a response to these, these uh, legislative pressures and governance that was coming in for environmental pressure. ASHRAE standards developments and developments from other organizations, also a big player. And energy modeling and life cycle analysis. Those sorts of things were starting to come in as well. In 2000, I was working with a program called Trace 700. I hope no one has to use it still. It was very tedious. But the process was there, and we were starting to expand, and different decisions were being made on equipment. A little bit more budget was being put forward to make sure that we were meeting regulation. It, it was an interesting time. So that's how the engineering design industry sort of responded to it. But the common result to constructors was just an increase in complexity again. Hot potato passed down the line. Increased presence of devices, an increased number of subsystems, need for digital monitoring, more quality assurance, more quality to control. Um, obviously, more technical personnel for coordination. Again, the beginning of the data revolution, where all these solutions were processors flowing data to be processed. So back to my timeline, just to finish it off here. The USGBC showed up in 2000 and CAGBC in 2003. Um, since then, there's been programs that have been popping up uh, here and there, good ones, well. Um, the Living Building Challenge, uh, the Resilient Standard, Rely, that's coming out right now to address issues with global warming that are happening here and now. Um, those things all started to really ramp up the amount of documentation and added to the system complexity that we already had going. So the United Nations in 2000, remember the Kyoto Accord? Uh, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, and then again in 2015, the, uh, the meeting in Paris, where uh, countries, again, well, most countries, made commitments um, for, for a greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and also, uh, I mentioned here CDP. Now, this is an odd one. Um, this is a survey group that actually works with companies to do carbon accounting. They've got about 80% of the Forbes 500 signed up for it. And, uh, you know, it's having its effect on, on supply chains and whatnot. And it's really sort of up to the conversation that we're having, and we're starting to see it in the construction industry now in RFQs and RFPs from various um, corporations that have gone through the process of their own carbon accounting. Uh, their first reaction is to turn down their supply chain and say, well, what are you guys doing? Do you, do you, have you dedicated any time to thinking about this? And for a construction company that is um, you know, client-led, that, that's, a, that's a fast call for change. So. I've, I've called this convincing each other ahead of government. I'm, I'm not trying to pr uh, promote anything at all. Carbon trade, call it a tax, call it a price. It's, it's a legislative pressure that's, that's coming. Um, and, and it's just an attempt to express pollution in terms of a mass of carbon gases produced. Um, we're going to establish a cost per unit, uh, unit mass of carbon production, and we're going to encourage corporations to plan and strategize to avoid pollution. Um, they're very good at that when you attach cost to it. Um, it, it makes it a bit of a, uh, of, of a possibility for, for a good game. 
The proceeds of that, of course, would fuel massive upgrades that we see um, in the various uh, roadmaps that have been published to date. And again, the carbon disclosure process uh, is, is there as well to help corporations really get an idea of what they're doing uh, to the environment under climate change, water, and forests. Um, and really the only reason I bring it up is, is the supply chain thing. Um, what, where we have sensed a real touch um, from, from above um, is clients asking us to fill out RFQs and RFPs, responding to very specific and very pointed questions about how we're dealing with carbon. Um, so it's, it's, um, here we are entering the, the carbon, carbon economy. And it's easy to get lost in that and think, oh, it's the carbon economy. It's not just sustainability. Oh, okay. So then the word game starts and the, the, the jargon begins to pick up velocity. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter what new detail, what new complexity that we're looking at. It's complexity. Each one needs to be on a list. Each one needs to be resolved. And each one needs its own solutions. Um, you'll find that this conversation in construction is sometimes very confused because one person or one group or another wants to take it in one direction or the other. But we have a list. We have a number of issues to get through. And we're going to respond to them the same way the engineers did. We're going to make use of what we've learned about building science. And what that looks like in terms of a shape, we've spoken about in various bits today already. Prefabricated construction, we're doing it at PCL as well. Um, we see it as a huge advantage for sequencing, um, safety, uh, good neighbors, if you have a noisy part of your project that you can get away from a downtown core and tell a client that, you know, we're not going to be keeping the condos awake, we're going to do all that off-site. All these things are huge advantages, and all it took was just a, a step back to, to see um, what could be done. Um, so again, we're going we're gonna to put that new focus on IPD methods and, and integrated project delivery. Um, IP-enabled devices, we're going to deploy our own IoT. Uh, IoT is something of a frustrating uh, term for me, um, I think it was made to make it sound as, as big as it is, just everything connected to the internet. Um, but it's just as simple as, rather than sending people down to a room to check if the humidity is right for the wood flooring we put in yesterday, we're going to have a sensor there and we're going to monitor it 24-7, we're going to wire it to our IP systems and we're going to report it to the client on a dashboard. Digital commissioning, using Revit as a central document and uh, getting commissioning ready early, like ASHRAE has always advocated for, getting those forms put together, getting the sequence of operations for, uh, together for, for these uh, systems, so that by the time it comes around, everyone knows where the documents are. They walk up to a piece of equipment, they tag the QR code, and suddenly all that commissioning documentation, information, and activity is fired straight into a database that the owner's going to have for the life of the building. It's, it's a very, very strange convergence, and it's an exciting time. Uh, so live data dashboards I mentioned, carbon accounting tools, cloud-based field computing so that all of this works together, um, and then finally, um, uh, carbon, uh, corporate carbon consciousness. All this response is basically, again, developing a digital, uh, digital process to address complexity. Uh, I don't think there's anything on that list that I haven't already touched on, so just in the interest of time, I will, uh, I'll move forward. Um, just as the last thing I want to do today, um, talking about the uh, complexity of supply chain and, and just trying to give people a frame, maybe some hope to the, to the, uh, to the crew that's um, embarked on their education in architectural engineering. Um, we have so much work to do, and we're very excited to have you guys. We're excited that you're being developed, and we're excited that, uh, that you're, you're on your way to the industry. Um, my friend did this a while back. Um, at least one person in the audience will know this guy. Uh, he was a master's degree in uh, industrial design, and they were asked to do uh, the taxonomy of, of some device that they had to go back and research where everything came from. So my friend started with the iPhone in the middle, and keeping in mind we all have one of these in our pocket, we go and start around the circle and start in the Apple store there, and we go up that, uh, this is actually designed after the London tube uh, maps, um, we go down the tube and we start looking at all the various components until we get up to the places where all these things were mined to make these components for these phones. That's where we start the carbon accounting string. That's where, where, that's where all the thinking begins. That's where you have to drill back down to to understand your embodied carbon in a building. Um, when we zoom back out and realize the magnitude of it, it's, it's quite daunting. That's a lot of companies, a lot of tasks, a lot of people, a lot of moving parts, a lot of governance to make sure that what they're saying they do is actually what they do. 
Um, and that's the phone in your pocket. So again, we are an industry that is facing a massive influx, a constant influx of complexity. The solutions and, 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 and uh, things that we're coming up with, they appear just in time for another problem to arise. So by all means, be encouraged, be excited to be an engineer for architecture. Um, dig in, read about all these things. There's tons of corners of this industry to go into, tons of complexity to solve. So thanks for coming today. Thanks again to the University of Waterloo. Uh, congratulations on the architectural engineering faculty, and uh, we hope to see some of you in the field. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, yes, complexity, I think, really the bane of our existence. Um, so our next speaker, uh, who's going to round out the panel, uh, is Dan De, uh, Delamotte, who comes from Malul Blamey, local uh, firm, lives here locally, uh, a ticketed carpenter who has worked his way through the ranks to now uh, oversee uh, the quality assurance processes at Malul Blamey. And these are interesting things about contractors nowadays taking on a lot more responsibility for making sure the products get delivered as we asked for. So uh, Dan, if you want to come up and wow us with your methodologies. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, so I'll dive right in here. I'm going to take you to, we've seen quite a few different things. We've seen the architect's mind. We've seen the consultants, the, de the developers. So I'm going to take you to the actual job site. And I'm going to go through a little bit of uh, the realities and the challenges that we face on the job site when it comes to how does this work? Oh, wrong way. There we go. I'm going to talk uh, about how we, we deal with quality management on the uh, construction site itself. So when we look at quality management, we know there's ISO 9000, we know there's Six Sigma, Lean. Not many of those are related to the construction industry. Uh, a manufacturing process tends to be fairly static whereas a construction site is, is dynamic, the variables are changing every day, sometimes hourly. So those are big challenges we do face when we look at quality management. We see a lot of requirements in the spec about quality control, but we don't see a lot about quality assurance, and I'll explain the difference in a minute here. We need to keep a quality management plan for our sites very simple, because our supervisors are already overwhelmed with work, they're overwhelmed with paperwork. One of the first things on their mind is safety, um, it's, a, it's a huge factor on our construction sites and it takes up a lot of time and resources. So, as far as quality management was concerned for us, we decided it was going to consist of a policy, a process, and a plan. The policy is to ensure all requirements of the specification drawings meet or exceed the client's expectations. The process is project specific for each job. And the plan involves quality assurance and quality control. And as I mentioned, there is a difference. In all cases, a good quality management plan will exceed the expectations of the contract. So as far as quality control is concerned, quality control is a testing and inspection that identifies deficiencies. It's already in place in most cases. We see it, uh, the consultants, the architects will do a final inspe deficiency inspection and they give us a big long list of things we have to take care of before we get paid. Um, so, and we see it in con concrete, we're often asked to, you know, cast some cylinders of concrete for quality control reasons. Um, building envelope inspectors, we see them a lot, and roofing is always inspected, we have a third party inspector in that. Now, quality assurance, on the other hand, is a focus on the, pro the planning and the processes that are implemented to prevent defects and deficiencies in the end product. Um, how we do this? We have checklists, we have protocols in place. We write a quality management plan for each project. That quality management plan is um, basically has our quality assurance protocols in it. It's organized in the master format tradition where we have it by divisions. Um, we do have a special section in the front for building envelope because as we know, building envelope crosses all divisions almost in the master format. Um, we educate our staff constantly. Uh, we train our staff constantly and mock-ups. Mock-ups on site are, are, are a huge thing to help everybody involved see the final product and how it's supposed to look. Not always required. If they're not asked for, you're not going to get them. 
So QA and QC, so quality control either validates or invalidates the quality assurance process. If quality control is discovering de defects, then the quality assurance process has to be modified or improved. Quality assurance is constantly improving and adapting process throughout the life of a construction company, basically. So when we look at quality assurance planning, we see that it starts at project development, it moves through to estimating, continues on pre-construction, construction, closeout, and warranty. And that all flows back, and quality management is occurring through all, step, all these steps here. And what we learn in the warranty stage gets filtered back to the project development mistake, stage, so we don't keep making the same mistakes twice. Or three times, you know, you gotta give us a bit of a buffer. Our goals are zero defects on project handover. We identify and solve problems before the customer or the consultant does. We establish quality control by making it built in and not inspected in. Um, and preventing mistakes is much more time and cost effective than correcting them. So if we make a mistake, um, and it's a big one, it's, it's almost impossible for us to make it 100% of what was expected. So we want to prevent the big mistakes from happening. We want to prevent all mistakes from happening. And the challenges of quality management, the buy-in. Now, when I talk about buy-in, I mean everybody's got a buy-in. The owner's got a buy-in. Obviously, he wants a quality building. Obviously, he wants a quality product. Is he willing to pay for it? Architects can buy in by adding more information in the spec, saying, you know, identifying the quality assurance procedures they want, saying, uh, you know, we want, we want to see your quality management plan. We want to know how you do it, and, and write that right in the spec, and, and you're going to get that. If it's not there, you might not get it. Schedule is a huge challenge for obvious reasons. Subtrades are generally in it for themselves. Now, Construction site, believe it or not, can be very confrontational. We've got 120 different people on site, all from different backgrounds, and yeah, there's a bit of conflict, if you can believe it. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. Subtrades are there. They're usually, a lot of them are smaller companies. They're, they're, their job's to get in and get out, get, their, get uh, their job done and get paid. So if they show up on site and there's, you know, they're, they're dealing with a, a a detail that has more than one trade and the one trade's not done, they're gonna just do their work and get out. It's up to us to develop a quality assurance protocol that tracks every stage of that transition or whatever it is where we've got multiple trades involved and make sure the work is done in order and the sub-trade is there at the right time. Staff changes are huge. Um, key staff leaves a project. Um, I heard grumblings earlier about government changes too. That can affect quality with uh, requirements under specifications and standards. Uh, the scope of work changes constantly, you know, oh, suddenly we realize we can't build it that way or funding ran out, we got to change this wall. As soon as we start changing things, again, we're back to that. It's not 100% anymore because we're, we're, we're changing the way it was done. We're starting over again. It's not going to be 100%. Lack of design details, that's huge. Um, earlier presentation showed the napkin drawings. Some jobs, that would be great. We would love to see that. We don't even get that. Uh, weather's a huge factor uh, in more ways than one. The number one problem with weather is, um, well, weather, basically. But um, basically, that's the reason we're here, right? Climate change. We're here about the weather. So we, we find that the quality of the forecasts is diving huge, like... Cloudy with a sunny periods and a chance of rain, yeah, you know, that's not very much good to me at all. When they call for, back in the day when they called for 40% chance of rain, we wouldn't consider pouring concrete above that. 40%, yeah, we might. 50%, forget it. We see a forecast of 90% rain now, we're still considering pouring concrete because the forecasts just don't seem to be as accurate as they used to be. However, we can follow the radar, and that's what we tend to do now. We don't listen to the forecast, we look at the radar. And, and of course, with climate change, things are changing, you know, uh, temperature differentials. We could see uh, 25 degrees in the day and minus 15 at night, so we're getting a massive temperature differential. You know, we pour concrete at uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it's 20 degrees. Who knew it was going to go to minus 5 overnight? Um, transitions are a, a huge challenge for us, and the reason is this little diagram here, the intersection of contracts. 
So what I mean by that is if we've got a brick wall, meeting a curtain wall, meeting a parapet, meeting a two-ply mod bit roof, we got six or seven different trades involved in that transition right there. And where the leaks can occur is if one of them doesn't do their job. So we need to be able to track not only the whole project, but that specific transition and make sure that all the steps were taken to make sure that we can proceed further with that. Um, lack of knowledge, we get it all the time. Guys, you know, subtrades are busy, so, you know, they're going to farm it out to another subtrade. And, you know, labor ready is always great for laborers. Why don't we get a couple guys to start putting this blue skin on? Not always a great idea. Actually, it's never a great idea. So we need to be up to speed on everything that's going on, all the products that are being used, so that we can pass that on to our people who can then pass it on to their subtrade. Uh, sequence, you've heard the term sequence quite a lot throughout the day. Um, my colleagues here mentioned it as well. It's, uh, it's a huge part of, of the job. Um, even times when we don't want to, like let's take a, a roof for instance. Say we got a single ply roof on a low roof and we got a brick masonry wall. With a single ply roof, you don't want to be doing brick on top of it. So we do the, the brick wall first and then we do the roof. It's out of sequence, doesn't always work. Probably a better idea to do the roof and protect it and then do the masonry wall. Um, so implementation, how do we do this? How are we going to implement this? Everybody must agree on the need for quality management. Should we get together and collaborate and decide what, we have quality standards, should we have quality new management standards? Like what level of quality should we be at? What, what should we as a builder be doing to make sure that, you know, we're going to make it there, we're going to get that quality? Um, again, a collaboration. Um, and do we see quality management the same way? The way I view quality management, does an architect see it the same way? Does an engineer see it the same way? Do we all see it the same way? Um, that brings up another note, not quite related to this topic, but do we all view sustainability the same way? Is my view of sustainability the same as um, the window suppliers or you know, the architect on the project? Do we all view it the same way? Um, we've heard the topic R&D, how R&D is not very... Um, Prominent in the construction industry, we lack it, but the R&D I'm talking about is research of new products and best building pro and practices for our industry. So we need to know, if we have a new product on site, we need to know everything about it. We need to dig into it, we need to find out everything we can about it, we call in the manufacturers, whatever we can, before that product even arrives on site. And the other part of research and development is the development of our people in our sub-trades, to develop their knowledge and, and uh, you know, make sure we've got the best people working for us out there. So how do we do it? We have symposiums for our people. Um, we have a, a, a program called W5.5. Uh, it's a program we put all our field staff through. Basically, you've heard W5 before, the what, when, who, where, um, why, and the point five is how, because it doesn't start with W, so it can't be a point. Uh, anyway, it's, it, it's amazing how much a, a person, a young apprentice works better when you teach them how to think, is basically what the aim of that program is. Um, we do mock-up stations as much as possible, orientations and uh, whatnot. We do a supervisor's round table where we get all the supervisors together, we sit down, discuss problems on site and what, uh, what best we can do to move forward with any uh, issues that we're having continually. Uh, we have a hardware, door and hardware course we teach our people. We have on-site specific training and lunch and learns. Um, manufacturers often offer training courses. Manufacturers are a great source for us. Um, a good manufacturer will have a good tech rep and uh, they are, they're more than willing to share their knowledge. If we have a new product, a lot of times we'll bring them to site and say, because they want that product to work. You know, it's in their best interest that that product performs well, gets installed properly, and makes them look good. So they're more than happy to help us and we use them quite a bit. And um, technical bulletins, it's important for us to get the technical bulletins on all the products that, are, that we're using. Um, sometimes they, they can be very important and they don't always trickle down to us so that we can implement them as builders. You know, the architect might get a technical bulletin and forget to pass it on to us and then the product fails. So then we have to ask ourselves, how do we keep track of all this? How do we possibly manage quality when there's so much different aspects on site that we have to look at. So we came up with a little, in the, a little idea, 
an innovation since it's Innovation Day. So I'm going to share it with you a little bit today. I do want to see the screen a bit here. So I'll try not to fall off the stage here. Does the laser work? Oh, office, lunch, and lunch. I forgot that little thing there. I got mesmerized by John there. So, Yeah, I know. So we start out with site work. And we start moving up the ladder. We have our base floor. And we have our transition. And we have our below grade walls. And our transition again. Above grade walls. Another transition. And our parapet. That is our product. That's what we deliver on all sites. Not, mainly not the whole thing. We might not do site work. But that's our product. That doesn't change. It's, it's a one product, one direction. We start at the bottom, we move up. From there, we, and I include transitions because that's very important. That's one, of the, that's one of the things that needs more attention than anything in the, in the quality management role that I have. So from there, we, we, we pan out. We have services, we have grading, we have elevator pits, we have exterior walls, building envelope, parapets, roof system, and then it pans out even further. So the second line is stuff that we know is going to need quality of management and attention from the spec. The second is we break it down. We start moving it across. So exterior walls, we have EW1, and it just keeps growing from there, and then we pan out that way to across, and we identify each layer of the construction of that particular item. Now here's a screenshot of an actual document that we use. Has everyone seen that enough? Or can I, you know? There's the actual flow, I, I'm going to call it the flow cast. It's still a bit in development. We've rolled it out on a couple sites, but I like the word flow cast. It's interesting that Stephen also had a flow chart in your diagram. So uh, it shows up kind of good. I do have a live document. I don't know, we don't have time for that, do we? I'll just explain it. <laughs> so what this is, is it's color coded. It identifies, I wish we could scroll down a bit. Uh, if you move across, it identifies the, the layers of construction, as I mentioned, but the, uh, all the yellow ones are our quality assurance protocols. When you click on that, up pops the quality assurance protocol that we have for that particular item. You can't really read it, but it's basically roofing, flooring, uh, there's concrete, masonry, and the yellow means that it's a quality assurance protocol. The green is a knowledge link, so when you click on that, it'll actually bring up knowledge of the product. And the blue is an actual drawing uh, detail of what, what that particular item is. And the red is where we use extreme caution. Basically, extreme, when I say extreme caution, I mean that's where we normally fail. That's where we need to spend more time and effort to make sure we get that right. So in, as buildings get more complex, as products get you know, more complex, as everything gets uh, harder to build, we got to build it faster. Can we manage quality? Absolutely, we can. Well, uh, thanks to the team here for putting together the, the work on, on each of those. Uh, and I'd say that's quite a broad a view of what's really going on on, on the building world, et cetera. And there's a lot of stuff there, uh, which is why, uh, I mean, We've seen everything from the future of, of uh, standards and the fact that we're going to see more heat pumps uh, to the challenge of managing risk uh, by doing things like off-site construction, um, uh, the, 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 the whole ball of wax that causes the complexity, which is I really do think is one of the biggest challenges we have. And sorry, Dan's last slide here, I kind of says, it tells you the kind of complexity that we're dealing with. And one uh, person's approach to training, how do we start to get our arms around all of that complexity when look through the lens of not cost or schedule, but look through the lens of quality, of making sure that you get what you expected. So uh, we have a few minutes for some questions. I don't want to shortchange anybody. So I'm, uh, if there's uh, somebody who wants to jump up, uh, grab one of those microphones and probe the uh, assembled intelligentsia uh, about, uh, you know, make it a really tough question would be, you know, that'd be what, what I'd be asking for. Any, any real tough questions? I am right here, your portable microphone. So maybe then I'll, uh, well, do we have someone who's speaking or? I'll, I'll have a leading question here. Um, 
how much is it, um, in terms of the technology or innovation in low carbon buildings, the theme of this conference, um, how much is it the technology that is the challenge to get, is it the technology that's the problem to get it delivered? Uh, is, is that the obstacle to these uh, new demands? Or what is, uh, if not the technology and the science, then what? Four people, four answers. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, it, it's, it's certainly not the technology. We have all the technology, I mean, both uh, the projects you see here today that were zero carbon, uh, net zero projects, all the stuff they were using was available 10 years ago. Um, you know, maybe in a slightly different package. VRF wasn't here uh, in North America, but it was certainly uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, and so I find the bigger challenge is um, uh, uh, costs and how to bring some of these technologies more cost effectively uh, into our projects. Uh, and getting people's head, and I, since I work in the design side, getting people's heads to wrap around that, um, you know, I mean, my, I, I'm a, as you said, I'm a mechanical engineer. I, I like to think that the enclosure should be the comfort system. And we're just heating and cooling the building to maintain the comfort. Uh, after that, um, and if you take that philosophy, everything becomes simple, and some of the complexity can get yeah. tamped down. <laughs> yes, tamped down. Rob, got any uh, thoughts it, on that? It's uh, it's funny. I mean, uh, construction for the longest time. Uh, I remember when I started, it, it was uh, it was always a, a, a big lag f to embrace the embrace technology. There was from a, from a new development to what, uh, to its uh, full implementation. There was a big lag, and whether it's in in, uh, in concrete how, technology how, or what or, or what have you. How long did drywall take to take off? Yeah, like, yeah, decades. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> but what I've seen in the last 10, 15 years is that, and I mean, it follows what's <laughs> happening all over the world. It, it's really uh, getting into into practice a lot quicker now. So I, I agree with Steve. The technology is there. Sometimes it's um, it's it's logistics in terms of where where, where we're at. Like some of the stuff I talked about. Uh, having enough uh, competitive, uh, competitors out there that, to, to, to bring that to the forefront. But I, I think the technology is there. Um, a lot of it, I think, is, is, is the limitations that, that, are, that are put out there for certain products. And I talked about that in, in, the, uh, in the codes. Uh, getting people to understand what we're actually talking about rather than referring back to standards that people can't even tell you where they came from. It was a number. Uh, and they couldn't even tell you where it came from. So not just broad brushing it, but, but there are specific things that, that are limiting uh, our, our technology, uh, the implementation of technology, which would benefit, uh, benefit the industry for sure. Steve. Yeah, I, I, I had to echo that uh, the technology is definitely coming along. Obviously, it's, it's still going. It's still evolving faster than we are. Um, process is really, to me, my, my, my biggest concern, my biggest issue. Um, a couple of years ago, a report came out that's now quite quite trendy to mention, but I'll mention it again, uh, the McKinsey Productivity Report, um, where construction is lagging behind manufacturing um, you know, Dramatic. dramatically. And, and that has a lot to do with adjusting process and, and, and yep. taking that dive, taking that risk to try a new system uh, to, to manage the complexities that we're seeing. So. Dan, comments? Money. Money? Money is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, are you a contractor? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want to pay me to use that technology, you know, great. No, I mean, yeah, just uh, selling it to a client even, you know. Um, this is new technology. This is what we want you to use. This is um, low carbon. It's also 145% more expensive than that, what you've been using. So if it was 45% yeah. cheaper, we'd be all over it. And then yeah. there'd be a, a higher demand for the technology, right? So it's money. Yeah. I thought supply chain was a word that I think at least Stephen used, but I think you might also you used it as well, yep. uh, Rob. Which I, is not a term we often hear. Certainly in the design side, <laughs> uh, people uh, think about technologies, but you're actually describing that. Yeah, there is quite a series of steps, and if they're not all in place, you can't risk selecting that technology because all the pieces aren't in place. Even though the technology is totally worked out, if the supply chain isn't there or the cost isn't right. We're, so maybe the research and development needed is to how do we make supply chains uh, and how do we get the cost down so that we don't have to make tough choices about selling um, the technology that we know to be better and getting us to low, low carbon. 
Your team. Earlier, and I'd like to get your comments. Stephen, I enjoyed your presentation quite a lot, but two questions I'd like to raise. Number one, the issue of carbon disclosure that actually is becoming quite a reality and it will permeate itself right through to the supply chain in terms of uh, what is the fossil fuel linkage to the particular aspect of the supply chain. It will translate into a cost, perhaps a higher cost. Uh, but that's very real, and if you can close your eyes and say that's not going to happen, there's nothing but trouble. And I think that's you. You pointed to it. I'm, I would, I'm seeking your your commitment on what level of cost impacts do you see in the construction sector emerging from the broader uh, challenge around carbon disclosure that's coming. That's the first one. But number two. I think is a more positive observation that I didn't get the right answer the last time I asked you, so I'm going to try it with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, I call them just for in a whimsical way, walking, talking buildings, if you wish. The notion that that intelligent uh, sensors, devices, IoT, intelligent controls, how we live and work within the buildings. We designed the envelopes, right? Fair enough. But then how they're living buildings. When you aggregate that through the IoT technologies, there is actually fundamental new, vast economic value to be created out of aggregation in terms of how you manage load, how much energy you use across different, different uh, buildings. What kind of thinking are you folks putting to, to get us to that world where buildings are truly alive and actually interacting with each other and the power grid and the transport sector through the electric vehicles. I may need to ask you to repeat the first question, but I'll answer the second one first. Um, the, uh, what, we're doing, it, what we're doing is sort of the, the, the building blocks of, of preparing for, for, for data flow, and then that did start with cloud-based computing so that data was going to be flowing constantly real-time to our teams as we're constructing and looking at the continuity of data from, from a project inception right to the point where we're demolishing the building rather than these sort of disjointed stages. Um, so as these buildings live and breathe, um, we're not really entirely familiar. I mean, we could, we could, uh, we could uh, ask Elon Musk what to worry about for AI. I, I, I don't, um, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I just know that for, for what we're doing to prepare, um, we know that we're going to need robust computing and communications that, that happen real time so that we can respond um, to what is now a living, breathing building talking to us. Um, we don't get to wake up the next morning and hear about the issue that that building is going to, to react. Um, that building is going to take care of whatever it can on its own. Um, but in terms of having our, our data recorded properly, um, all of our documentation better be dialed. Um, when, when there's a digital record like that, we, we, we have to be, again, our process has to be complete. The first question was related to carbon disclosure, supply chain, and impacts on cost uh, as it will ripple its way through uh, to the sector in terms of uh, uh, penalties on, on what carbon disclosure and carbon pricing might, might uh, result in for the supply chain. Oh, I mean, how it might how that might change what we do? The like. Pricing, I think, is what he was asking. Sorry. I think he was asking about the pricing yeah. implications of carbon disclosure as it ripples through the supply chain. Oh, oh. Um, well, first of all, the, the ramifications of what I mean, I, I went through the survey um, at least uh, in terms of reading it. Um, in, enormous uh, ramifications. I, and I, I don't. Uh, I'm not an economist. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, what's exciting about it to me is that, is that there's all these corporations aligning to be able to speak about it, whether they're legislated to be responsible for it yet or not. They simply want to be able to have the conversation, know what their risk is, um, and make some assessments now. But obviously, um, every step forward that we take, that looking at legislation and greenhouse gas, the first, the first glance is usually a, a, a cost increase, which is where, where we've had troubles with it in, in, in construction. Uh, um, I can comment to the disclosure a little bit. I, I was actually at a, a session last week. So all these buildings that are doing zero carbon, um, we're meeting together every few months to talk about what's going on and what our challenges are. Um, and carbon disclosure is coming, uh, especially to Canada. Uh, the National Research Council is starting a three, a three to five year project starting in January. 
Um, and the basic goal is that all federal projects will have to understand their embodied carbon and start reporting on it. Um, what I found really interesting about that whole committee talk that day is everyone re related the state of embodied carbon in buildings uh, to the early days of energy modeling. That was almost a consensus around the table was that uh, if you roll the clock back 20 years, we barely knew what we were doing with energy modeling, uh, especially at the design stage. If you're the design stage, you were asking me to say, what do you think the lighting power densities are going to be, plug densities, wall performance, and I had no drawings to look at. I had very little places to go. And if we're going to make those types of design decisions about embodied carbon in buildings, when we start doing Athena analysis, we need to know that information without drawings. <laughs> um, which is to say, we, we need experience, we need better uh, standards to evaluate and understand what carbon we're going to include in the building. Um, even the, the Canadian Green Building Council, with their zero carbon building standard, they say, include all the structure and enclosure. And we're like, OK, where does the enclosure end? Yeah. Do we include the interior drywall? And they kind of stared back at us and we don't know. So these standards have not been fully worked out yet. Now, there are other jurisdictions in the world where they have, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to go, you know, it's com this one, my, my, my major comment is we're coming, we're going to have some teething issues, but it is, it is coming to our markets uh, probably in, in five to ten years. All right. I think I'm getting the uh, white cane. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for sharing your wisdom. Uh, five minutes, right?